A while back, we discussed molten chloride salt fast reactors and their potential to consuming existing stockpiles of nuclear waste as fuel. Today, we will be discussing the technology with the man who plans on building it. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Rock Logic. I am your host, Sean Kenny, and today we have a very special guest. Uh, he is the co founder and chief technology officer of Elysium Industries, a company uh, which has a radically different approach on molten salt reactors and uh, plans on addressing our country's issues in regards to uh, nuclear waste stockpiles. I'm joined by Mr. Ed File of Elysium Industries. Ed, thank you for coming on the show today, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Of course, it's an honor. Uh, so, uh, to get before we get started, um, I think it's worth addressing that uh, there are many nuclear or advanced nuclear startups. Uh, a lot of the founders have uh, some sort of engineering background. You, uh, however, are a full blown nuclear engineer with uh, over three decades of experience uh, designing reactors for the Navy. Uh, would you care uh, to elaborate uh, what that was like and uh, how you got started in this field? I originally came out of college with a plasma degree, a fusion degree, Whoa. right? But I went to work for the Navy operating reactors and training them to operate them. And then I went into the design work for them. And, and one of the things that the Navy always does is designs, looks at designs for other types of reactors that might compete with theirs or that might have a better strategic advantage. So I've looked at every kind of reactor that you can possibly imagine. And I have, because I was not a specific water reactor trained person, I was able to look at all those other reactors and see the advantages and disadvantages of each of those. And so I always got drawn into those type of studies for other types of reactors. And even, even for a reactor to go to uh, Jupiter's moons, uh, which that was a lot of fun, but mm. I always liked working on advanced reactors, but you know, I, I always had that baseline of, of doing the integrated plant and reactor design, nuclear design for the, the baseline water reactors that they do. Hmm. Uh, I, was, I was starting up uh, or helping start up two reactors a year when I left there to come out and help the commercial industry. Huh. Interesting. And what, what kind of help did you do with the commercial industry, uh, if, if you don't mind me going into that a little bit? Well, for the commercial industry, the goal is to develop an advanced reactor that analyzes and solves a lot of the, the, the concerns that people have. The questions are, what about the cost? What about the waste? Uh, what about the proliferation? And, uh, and what about doing things like hydrogen generation and process heat because water reactors really can't get to the temperatures needed for doing that. Hmm. So the goal was to solve a lot of the public policy issues associated with nuclear plants. Of course, always, what about the safety? And we want passive safety, of course. Mm. So you absolutely know your stuff uh, when it comes to advanced reactors. I think there's like no dispute <laughs> as far as that's concerned. Uh, I guess, uh, would you mind telling us a little about what you're doing now with Elysium Industries and uh, what kind of sets you apart from, I guess, what everyone else is trying to work on? Well, you, are you asking if, about what is our reactor like sure. specifically? So our reactor, um, we've looked at all the different types of reactors that are out there, even looked at fusion. Hmm. And the goal, again, was to solve a lot of the, the problems that people had. And if you do a thermal reactor, you always end up having waste that you have to uh, store or reprocess or um, put in a deep repository. So that kind of ruled out most of the thermal reactors, which is most of them. Um, the other issues are things like cost. When you make solid fuel, even in a fast reactor, you have because you have solid fuel, it gets, gets damaged and you have to reprocess it every four or five years or so. And the reprocessing and the making the new fuel is very expensive. So the economics aren't very good. So we mm looked at molten salt reactors, specifically fast molten salt reactors, to solve those economic problems and um, uh, the fuel utilization problems uh, that are associated with the, the solid fuels or the thermal fuels. And, and when, when we said, well, what about the waste? 
Well, that also includes, well, what about the waste that's already been created? All right, so all the light water reactors have created 83,000 tons of what people call spent nuclear fuel, which I call stored nuclear fuel instead, because it's 96% new fuel and 4% uh, spent fuel. Um, so we wanted to use that as well. So we designed the reactor to be able to consume that as our main fuel until mm -hmm. it's all gone. And we can foresee it being all gone if we go to high electricity use from nuclear and process heat um, up to 1000 C. We can even get to higher temperatures if we use boosters and um, uh, hydrogen and arc, arc furnaces. Very cool. Yeah, I've uh, I've actually done a fair amount of reading into fast reactors. I, I really like how uh, they have the potential to reduce the radiotoxicity levels of nuclear waste. Actually, one of our viewers actually commented recently mentioning the uh, integral fast reactor experiment that the U.S. worked on uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, do you mind discussing like the operational parameters of your reactor? Like how how different is your reactor? Uh, from what the U.S. worked on back in the uh, back in the 1980s. Back in the 1980s, and that the IFR was a sodium fast reactor with metallic fuel. Mm. It was specifically designed to allow easy reprocessing using a method called pyroprocessing, which was much simpler than the method that, say, France uses for reprocessing, which is Purex. Right. Mm. So the, they they were trying to get costs down. The issue was the remanufacturing and the reprocessing of it was still fairly expensive, less expensive than Purex. The, the problem is uranium was found to be quite abundant. And so uranium prices dropped and the price of enrichment went from a diffusion method to a centrifuge method. And the cost of enrichment went down by over an order of magnitude. And when you did that, it was still cheaper to get uranium out of the ground and enrich it than it was to even do pyro processing. So that's kind of where that program dropped. But a lot of that's associated with the fact that you had to do it every four years. Hmm. So how we're different is we use that stored nuclear fuel to put in our reactor. We add a little bit of plutonium waste, which in the United States is weapons material, which people want to get rid of as well to get the reactor started and so we started up and then we just feed it uh, spent nuclear fuel or stored nuclear fuel from then on hmm. but we keep adding it uh, about a ton a year but we don't since our fuel is liquid we don't have to remanufacture that solid fuel that's an enormous savings in itself but we also don't purify it for 40 to 60 years. So instead of that four year cycle of total reprocessing and remanufacturing, we wait for 40 to 60 years and we move, remove a lot of the fission products, but not all of them. That allows us to, to essentially reduce the cost of that purification. So it's not nearly as expensive, much simpler process, uh, two steps instead of seven steps in the, in the, for the, re, for the, purification versus reprocessing. So a lot lower cost. We don't have to get it clean because it's a liquid fuel. We don't have to handle it in the manufacturing process. These are huge differences from trying to do solid fuel and closing the fuel cycle. So in 40 to 60 years, we'll burn about um, 40 to 60 tons worth of wow. stored nuclear fuel, right? That's hmm. not a lot compared to 83,000 tons. But if you build enough of them and you you do process heat and uh, high electricity, then you can consume a lot of that very quickly in a few hundred years. Interesting. So if, if you don't mind me asking, in terms of uh, just using spent nuclear fuel as a resource, not even looking at MOX fuel or any of the other stuff that we've talked about, uh, how long of a how, how long do you think that could last us to meet, like, say, uh, North American standard of livings in terms of energy uses. Is it like a hundred years? Is it a thousand years? Well, let's, let's set some parameters about how much you're going to use first. Okay. If we replaced all of today's nuclear reactors in the United States with a molten chloride salt fast reactor hmm. at the same power rating as all those reactors total, then the 
stored nuclear fuel would last about 16, 1,600 years. Oh, okay. Right? That's... If you went to, if you went to 100% nuclear electricity on molten chloride salt fast reactors, then you're talking about um, uh, divide that by five, basically. So about um, 320 about, years. About 300 years. Well, I'm just rounding off, but yeah, about sure. 300 years. If you also, so right now, electricity is about 25% of our overall uh, energy use. If you mm -hmm. went to use all of our energies, then you divide that by another factor of four, hmm. right? So maybe a hundred years that you would be able to consume all the stored nuclear fuel. But that's only if you made them all that type of reactor. In addition to the U.S., obviously, um, there have been several other countries uh, that have been looking into fast reactors. Uh, the French, they had the Phoenix and the Super Phoenix. Uh, the Japanese, I believe they had the Moju reactor. Uh, the Russians, I believe they still have some fast reactors that are still in operation. I know the Chinese are also looking to go that route. Um, one of the, uh, obviously there's a lot of benefits to using fast reactors, it seems like, but, uh, there are some disadvantages that I've read about specifically that, um, in the past fast reactors were notoriously costly, both in terms of upfront capital costs and operational expenditures. Um, I guess, uh, how does your reactor, uh, really address that concern? And I guess, uh, is it cheaper to operate? Is it cheaper to build? If so, I guess, hypothetically, what could a utility provider be expected to pay for one of your reactors? Well, I don't have a specific cost for our type of reactor, okay. but you are right. The, the sodium fast reactors have traditionally been about 25 to 50% more expensive than light water reactor cousins. Mm. Um, a lot of that was in the fuel. It was also in the safety systems and training associated with handling sodium and sodium fires in the plant. The, the, the reactor itself, the, that's not really a sodium fire issue because the second loop has sodium in it as well. It's mm. the second loop that's going out into the plant that has a tendency to leak and cause fires. And, and that's, that's really where the, the costs were associated with those. Um, but in reality, materials are higher temperature the turbine materials are higher temperature, so those are going to cost more. Typically, you would get that back in efficiency savings, right? Mm. We're not interested in efficiency savings necessarily because we want to consume the waste. If we're inefficient, then we burn more waste, right? Mm. So the whole point of going to higher efficiency, whether it's a gas plant or a coal plant or standard nuclear reactors or fast reactors, is to get the fuel use down, right? When fuel use is a benefit, in our case, stored nuclear fuel, depleted uranium, and such not, then you don't have to necessarily work at the efficiency. The biggest part of the cost of a plant is the power conversion system, right? And so that's 85% of the cost, 15% is the nuclear island, right? Mm -hmm. So the, in a light water reactor, the reason why the, power plant is so expensive is because it is low temperature and you need part of those systems to be safety rated to be able to cool the reactor. The nice thing about advanced reactors is they are high temperature and you can dump decay heat to air. Hmm. So you don't need that power conversion system to be part of that. So one of the things that we're doing is making sure that that power conversion system is not safety rated because that's a lot more expensive to get qualified and all the components and materials and stuff certified. The goal is to say, here's the reactor. You can put whatever plant that you want that you already designed attached to that. Say you want to, you already know how to build coal power plants, all right? Mm. Throw away the coal burner and attach the power plant and you're good to go without having to have extra certifications. All right, so that's the goal is to make the, power conversion system more of a commodity item and drive the cost down, mm. right? But the reactor is simpler. We have nothing in the core, nothing that gets damaged and replaced all the time. Um, so that's a lower cost. We don't, if we don't care about efficiency, we don't have a lot of um, reheaters and preheaters. 
on it to drive efficiency up. Those are additional components that need to have maintenance. Um, the reactor is uh, passively operated, self-load following, so we don't need a lot of people for doing that. Um, so that's driving the cost down. Just looking at the fuel, right? If you go from a solid fuel to a liquid fuel, gets the cost down in order of magnitude. If you go to burning waste, instead of bought uh, fissile fuel, then we're, we're talking about another order of magnitude reduction cost. Fuel cost as an operating cost perspective on a light water reactor is about one third of the cost of operations, right? If you go to a liquid fuel, you drop that to about 3%. So the fact that we drop it to 0.3% is no different than 3% from a utilities perspective. Basically the fuel cost is nothing. At that point. Interesting. And so that that means your your operating costs have dropped almost by a third. Hmm. And a simpler plant means there's less maintenance. So there's less maintenance costs associated with the, the our reactor. Hmm. Not just maintenance costs, but from what I've seen, and I've I've looked at several lectures that you've given uh, both to the Thorium Energy uh, Alliance and various other places. Uh, you talk a lot about modularity. A lot of people, myself included, when we've talked about reactors, were really just talking about things like the integral molten salt reactor, where the way we approach modularity is uh, we build a single, whether it's a hundred or 200 megawatt reactor. And if a utility wants to buy more power capacity, they buy more reactors. You take a completely uh, different approach in terms of modularity by, uh, I guess, separating out into various components. Uh, do you mind discussing that a little bit? Like how, how would the scale exactly? That, that's actually very important. Uh, the integral reactors, um, the power rating is kind of limited by the heat transfer area. Mm. Core has heat transfer that limits the size. But if you're putting the first heat exchanger, whether it's a steam generator or what, into the reactor vessel, that limits the reactor vessel size, all right, to something fairly low power, all right? And that's why when you do an integral reactor and you want to do it modularly, you have to buy in a whole nother reactor because you can't really scale up the heat transfer area to get more power out of it. With the liquid fuels, um, the fuel is not damaged, all right? So we can have whatever power that we want. Specifically for molten chloride, the fuel isn't damaged, all right? The molten fluoride thermal reactors, the fuel's not damaged, but the graphite moderator is, all right? So that still limits the size. And graphite usually makes it bigger, but the the, so what we did is we identified that the heat exchangers were driving the size of the reactor. So we put the heat exchangers outside, hung it on the outside of the reactor. That's actually what is called a modular configuration mm. instead of an integral configuration. So there's a lot of different definitions of modular here, right? So, sure. so, so our smallest heat exchanger is 125 megawatts thermal, which is about 50 megawatts electric. And you can scale that up by either adding more 125 megawatt thermal heat exchangers, or you can swap it out for a 500 megawatt thermal, 200 megawatt electric hmm. uh, equivalent heat exchanger, and then start adding heat exchangers from that. So we can go at um, in 200 megawatts electric steps from um, 200 up to 1200. Right, just by adding heat exchangers, because the core power density just increases, hmm. right? Because there's nothing in there to damage, because chloride salts repair themselves about five orders of magnitude faster than the radiation damages them, and there's nothing hmm. solid. So, so that allows us to basically um, build a reactor and a core, and if you want. 125 or 200 megawatts, or excuse me, 50 megawatts electric or 200 megawatts electric, or the equivalent in process heat um, for something, then you can start with that. And then just buy new heat exchanger sets and new turbines and add them on rather than and use the same reactor. You don't have to buy another reactor. Oh, interesting. Does that also help you, I guess, down the road in terms of uh, site licensing for like a nuclear power plant, like say, if a utility were to buy one of your reactors and buy it at a lower power threshold and then say 
their power demand goes up, they decide instead of building a whole new reactor and going through the licensing process, is it easier just to add more components to, I guess, scale up the power usage of your plant? Or is there a, a different regulatory regime in regards to that? If you upgrade a reactor, you still have to go to the regulator to get an upgrade. The, mm -hmm. the advantage of this is you are upgrading an already well-known reactor. You've already analyzed it for full power and you're adding components that the regulator is already familiar with, i.e. Gotcha. identical to the first ones that you already have. So that makes the, the up rate regulation easier than if you tried to build, uh, tried to upgrade, say, a light water reactor today, because you're basically, to upgrade a light water reactor, you have to basically fine tune your calculations to get more power, whereas we're just duplicating stuff that they're already familiar with. Got it. And obviously from a cost perspective, it's, there's already an advantage to that because it's just easier to just plug in more heat exchangers and whatnot to, uh, to scale up the power usage of the, uh, of the plant. Right. You don't have to buy a whole new reactor or a control system or off gas system. That's already all, all there. Hmm. Okay. Very cool. Um, I guess seeing as we're talking about, I guess, site licensing and regulations, can you build a prototype uh, reactor under current NRC guidelines, or do we need to see more changes occur in our, regulator, uh, in our regulators before something like this could be built in, uh, in the United States proper? According to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they can license a molten salt reactor um, as long as you keep it below 10 megawatts thermal mm. and you don't have a power conversion system on it. Okay. Right, what they call a non-power reactor. Um, the the non-power reactor is kind of an anachronism because it's really associated with um, the fact that the power conversion system had a lot of safety systems that they had to license. Mm. And in our case, that's not true. Um, we isolate the power conversion system from any of the safety systems. So we could put a power system on there, all right? Mm. And not affect the safety. Uh, not have the regulator looked at look at it. So that's a little bit anachronistic. The NRC also says that 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 demonstration or test reactor at that low power rating is not allowed to make more than about 50% of the cost of building it. Um, I find that really odd, considering every time I ask questions of the NRC about uh, economics, they're not allowed to look at economics but yet there's a rule that says they have they are preventing you from being economic hmm. so uh, that that's an oddity but those are kind of the fine details the, but the whole point of a test reactor is to really test out the physics of the reactor at low power and specifically at low radioactive fission product source term in hmm. other words if something went wrong there's not much there to release and so there's not much to harm anyone. I see. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So it's not, uh, so it's not impossible to build a prototype under NRC guidelines, but obviously there's a bit of a, uh, it's a bit convoluted with the way the regulations are set up. Um, yeah, so they could be improved as okay. I discussed in a few areas and there are probably more. I'm not a, a regulatory strong person, but for instance, I, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, one of the companies, well, several of the companies, the, the, the small water reactor and a heat pipe fast reactor, both applied to licenses for the NRC, right? Um, the NRC er, said the water reactor was going to be 46 months to license, even though they had a guideline that if you tried to license a large reactor, it'd be less than 39 months. And yet, you know, that was a passive water reactor and they said 46 months, right? Mm. The, the, the point of small modular reactors is they do have a smaller source term. The other heat pipe fast reactor has a factor of a thousand less source term than Fukushima did. Mm. And yet they're still telling them three years to license it. Okay. That's, that's inappropriate. If you have that factor of a thousand extra safety in your pocket it should yeah. take far less than than three years to license it it's it's like i'm saying you know the they said they would license our uh test reactor 
in one or two years and at 10 megawatt thermal. Well, this company is basically at, um, at uh, I think it's about eight or nine megawatts thermal. Hmm. And so lower source term even than ours, and yet they're still telling them three years. Hmm. That's it, odd. it should be somewhere on the order of, you know, a factor of a, uh, like maybe one to two years just to get familiar with the license for sure. that 10 megawatts thermal. Hmm. Yeah, that that is uh, that is particular odd, and I know it's it's vastly different from like say what the uh, I forget what the agency is called, but the Canadian Nuclear Regulatory um, Agency up in Canada, they have a vastly different uh, regulatory regime. I don't know the specifics, but it seems like it's easier to license an advanced reactor in Canada than it is in the United States. No, it's so not the United, the United States. If you count pre licensing work and licensing, licensing of a design is, as I said, is supposed to be three years. Pre-licensing is usually about two years. That's about five to six years um, total minimum licensing time. I'm not saying that it actually occurs that fast, but that's right. what the, the regulator thinks is a minimum licensing time. In okay. Canada, the, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission has a process for pre-licensing and licensing that is a minimum of 11 years. Oh, wow. For licensing any reactor, any size. Huh. So we originally formed um, we originally formed um, in Canada thinking that the regulatory system was easier and because the United States was anti-MSR, right? We convinced the DOE that they should support molten salt reactors and stop giving the technology to China, and they did. And then when we saw the regulatory differences of being about half the time as in Canada, we essentially shifted back to the U.S. as our focus, but it huh. took both those things. One is the long regulatory period, and the other is, well, the United States just didn't allow it before 2015. Hmm. So, uh, so has the, so it seems like the Department of Energy has been pretty helpful in this regard, uh, especially in the last several years. Um, they've been issuing grants to nuclear start uh, startups, and uh, I I believe uh, you you were also a recipient of the Gain program, were you not? Yes. We've had oh. two gain awards. One, the first gain award was to test production of our fuel salt, which we did um, at uh, Argonne National Lab and Idaho National Lab, hmm. right? Which was basically to take um, spent MOX fuel to use the, the term people are familiar with, uh, I'll call it stored MOX fuel, um, and converted that into chloride salt fuel. All right, so that was our first gain award. And that was, I think, 2016 timeframe uh, okay. to 2017. It takes a while because of contracts and stuff of the, the government. Sure. And then uh, we're currently in the process of finishing another one up on fuel cycle evaluations uh, to as confirmatory analyses to our uh, uh, calculations hmm. of that within the DOE. So one of the things that, that we pay attention to, to try to get the cost down. Working with the national labs is not necessarily cheaper or faster, but the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is gonna to go to the national labs to help understand what your design is, all right? So having at least confirmatory or calculational stuff done at the national lab is a benefit, even though there's maybe a cost penalty compared to doing it privately, hmm. all right? So because of the fact that the regulator is going to look to them. Interesting. Uh, well, that's that, that gives me a fair bit of hope, and I learned a little bit more about uh, the NRC than uh, that I originally had. So, thank you for that. Um, just to kind of switch gears here, um, one of the greatest appeals that I find with your reactor is, as you say, it's completely fuel flexible, right? You can run it on spent nuclear fuel, you can run it on MOX. Uh, you can run it on depleted uranium. Uh, and I've seen s several lectures that you've given where uh, you've also advertised that it could potentially run uh, on uranium-233 and thorium in like a two-fluid setup. Um, could your reactor potentially be uh, uh, configured to produce medical isotopes? And if so, what sort of challenges arise from doing so, if you don't mind me asking? Pretty much all reactors make the same isotopes. So what mm. the fuel is, is kind of independent of whether you can make medical isotopes. Okay. And so um, 
can our reactor do medical isotopes? Yes, it can, right? But from a proliferation and public view of proliferation more along that line is we are trying not to do any online uh, processing so that people don't think that we're removing stuff, mm. but you could do it. Um, but of course, that's going to increase the cost to be able to put that kind of system in. And it would have neutronic benefits, but you don't need, you know, 50 or 100 reactors to make medical isotopes. You need two or three. Okay. To do that. So you would only just do a few. Hmm. As far as using thorium, um, we can use thorium. Our reactor is not sized uh, diameter wise um, to do pure thorium and uranium 233. And that's in part because if you do pure uranium 233, that's weapons grade material, mm -hmm. right? Which is, cannot be done commercially. You can do it as a military um, group as MSRE did, um, but you can't do it as a commercial group. Um, but um, the intent is to be able to use a mixed uranium plutonium, uh, thorium uranium 233 in the current reactor size that we have now. So. Can we use thorium? Yes. Can we use pure thorium? We choose not to. Okay. So it's possible, but you choose not to. Uh, that's yeah. that's fine. That so, makes sense. So another another area on radioisotopes is, if you think about it, um, our reactor is liquid fuel. Mm. If radioisotopes are typically made in like test reactors and something like that, where sure. you design a specific test cell to put targets down in. Uh, and you have to design the fuel around that to be able to work. Well, being a liquid fuel that can't be damaged, you can put that cell anywhere in the core that you want or right outside the reactor vessel that you want and just add more fissile um, to compensate for the absorptions of that tube. So you can put a separate tube down with a rabbit or ability to remove it during operation or something like that um, to make those radioisotopes more simply than having a reactor that's specifically designed for it. For instance, if you look at the, the uh, Kandu reactors at Darlington, they have what they call gray rods. And AP1000 has them too, but they haven't done this yet. And they put, um, they put uh, um, targets in there to make cobalt-60 for sterilization and cancer treatments and such. And they can also put in uh, Neptunium-237 into the gray rods and make plutonium-238 for space uh, radiothermal isotope generators. Um, hmm. So you can do it. Doing it with a regular reactor gives you a lot more volume to make those materials um, than if you have a specific test reactor uh, that's used for other things. Hmm. Okay, very cool. Well, having you on the show has been a, a tremendous honor and privilege, Ed, and I, I can't stress enough to say thank you for coming on. Um, I would be doing myself and our audience a disservice if I didn't ask, uh, where do we go from here? Uh, what uh, what are you guys planning to do in terms of, I guess, commercial rollout or, I guess, uh, demonstrating this technology to uh, our regulators to prove that this is a more effective design? Is there a timeline on that or are we just sort of... Uh, if you could elaborate on that. There, there is a target timeline. Uh, we expect to build a, a demonstration fuel production facility oh. um, probably by 2026 or so. Okay. Um, hopefully sooner um, because the sooner you get that fuel production made, the smaller you can design it to be mm -hmm. and lower cost, right? With a reactor operation for that 10 megawatts thermal, in the 27, 28 timeframe. Of course, that all depends on funding and regulatory um, support and uh, Department of Energy um, funding as well. Uh, so there's there still is not a lot of acceptance in the Department of Energy for alternate reactors from water reactors and sodium reactors and um, gas reactors. Hmm. I, the uh, ARDP that they just funded for $80 million went to their standard old gas reactor and sodium fast reactor, right? So they're hmm. attached to that. And part of it's because the companies have been out there doing it for 70 years, hmm. right? So that, that's what they're familiar with. That's what the national labs are familiar with. And they're less comfortable with 
molten salt reactors and heat pipe fast reactors. Okay. Cool. Well, um, yeah, I think that's all the questions we have today, Ed. Uh, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. And, um, uh, yeah, we appreciate having you on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Yeah, same here. <laughs> well, I'll have to have you back on here again someday. Thank you so, uh, so much. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Awesome. Well, that concludes our interview for today. Again, I am Sean Kenny, and this was Rock Logic. Hey, thank you so much for uh, watching today's episode. Uh, we're a new podcast, so we really appreciate if you like this video and subscribe to it. My producer, Jessica, says that I'll get a cookie uh, for every new subscriber we get. Maybe if I'm good enough, she'll let me outside. Is that good? Yeah, all right. Hmm. That's good. That's a good cookie.